Struggles of a Dojo Family by Kieran Mueller I'm not sure how old I was when my father brought me a special book to read. My best guess is that I was about six years old. Calling it a book wouldn't be quite right, as, with 40 pages and lots of pictures, it was more of a comic book, but it was perfect for me. I'd say it was a kind of superhero comic, but it was about a real person. If you know anything about my family, then you know superheroes are big with us. The book told the tale of Professor Don Jacob about his life and his martial arts. My young mind was captivated by everything about him. He grew up in the small island of Trinidad and Tobago, where he battled poverty and many challenges. Professor was born in the ghettos of Port of Spain, and because he was from a broken home, he was raised by his grandmother. I like that he, like me, also lived on an island. Even at six years old, I felt lucky to live in a safe and friendly place like Victoria, British Columbia. Don Jacobs' story explained how he went from the toughest of circumstances in a third world country to becoming an internationally renowned jujitsu master. His comic book told how, as a young boy, he was saved when he was introduced to martial arts training, how his sensei molded and influenced him to find his greatness and teach him to not have a ghetto mentality. He said, I was from the ghetto but I was not part of it. This small comic book was the greatest inspiration to me. I must have read that book a thousand times, turning every page and never once losing my excitement. It turned out that this superhero was a friend of my dad. I remember the day my father invited the professor to stay in our home. I introduced myself, and he smiled with his big white teeth. He picked me up in his long arms, hugged me, and then spun me upside down, making me do a backflip. It was awesome. To me, he was a seven-foot-tall giant with the biggest hands you have ever seen. He was an imposing character in every way, with massive superhero muscles and a big personality. In reality, while he was a big man, he was not very tall and not as imposing as how I pictured him as a child. But my childhood memories reemerged when, years later, he stepped onto the mat of our dojo. He was there to teach and demonstrate, and it was incredible. There was silence as everyone, including my dad, waited for him to speak and teach his art. Professor's story and ability made me want to train and be like him. This man is my hero. Some of my heroes live a little closer. I am the youngest of four, with one sister. Brittany, and two brothers, Drew and Lee. I believe that I received this book just before my mother and father divorced. Until now, it never occurred to me why Dad gave me the book. When my father moved out, my eldest brother, Lee, became a surrogate dad for me. This made our relationship kind of odd. Lee and I are separated by ten years, but even when he was a teenager, he was never too cool to sit and play toys with me. I began karate, like my siblings, when I was four years old. My father told us that we needed to start young, but we could quit whenever we liked. That is, after we got our black belt. It was the family rule and we all abided by it. Dad never taught us directly, as he didn't want the appearance of any family favoritism in the dojo. As such, Lee has always been my teacher. Outside of the dojo, He was always a fun and playful guy, but, as the sensei, when he stepped on the mat, he became a different person. Does that ring any bells? I know he had something to prove as a young man running a karate school, and it was his goal to make his students the best. I have always admired his drive and intensity. Lee was a very tough and strict teacher, and I believe he added a little extra dash of toughness just for me. Thanks. I also know he did that because he wanted me to be a top student like him. But sometimes, when he was around, it put me on edge as I constantly thought I was doing or saying something wrong. A step out of place in the dojo and he'd send me to the wall to sit in a chair position until my legs screamed or do push-ups until my arms fell off. 
I knew he always had my back and cared for me, but I'll admit that sometimes he scared me. In the dojo, there were always great events with cool demonstrations. I loved these demos. Lee, as the sensei, was always the main event. He would throw his ukes, attackers, around like it was nothing. He had learned jujitsu directly from Professor Jacob in Trinidad, and now he appeared like a superhero. I am sure everyone who saw those demonstrations thought so too. It was during a demo one day that I remembered the book. That's when I saw the spirit of my hero in my big brother. I was in awe as I found another hero. Sandwiched between Lee and me, our family has two other black belts you may not know of. Closest in age to me, by five years, is my brother Drew, and we have that classic brother bond. We were good buds as young children, sworn enemies as teens, and best friends in adulthood. I idolized him, as most little brothers do with their older siblings, and I thought everything he did was the coolest, right down to his name. I was always following him and copying everything he did. Drew was a tremendous martial artist, but modest and quiet, making him, in some ways, the black sheep of our clan. To that, I believe he is also the most talented member of our family. Between Drew and Lee lies Brittany. My sister is the toughest of all of us kids. I don't remember much about my relationship with her, save for the regular sisterly things a girl might do with the baby of the family. I believe I found myself in many dresses and with painted nails. Brit, like an unbridled mare, left home as soon as she could. Not because of unhappiness, but at 18 years old, confident and ready for the world, she needed to test herself to see what she could do. To this day, she has never stopped, or in dojo terms, she is unstoppable. She found an amazing and somewhat famous life in Vancouver. I'd say she has maximized her black belt training with a life philosophy and outlook that we all lean on. Although she was a fairy ride away, she was always there if I needed help, like learning how to drive or with some of the teenage issues that almost ruined my life. I say, honestly, that I am a mama's boy, and my mother is the best. She is the only one in our family who does not have a black belt. But when angered, her 5'3 stature and 95 pounds is a force of nature. I'd say she is as fierce a warrior as you might care to meet. Mom was the disciplinarian. No matter what, she did everything for me and has always been there. My stepdad earned my love and my respect. But as a teenager, I put him through hell. He knew I didn't want him but he taught me a lot about love and perseverance. Through all the crap I put him through, he could have left me for dead. But he didn't. He stayed true and hung in there eventually winning us all over. As a man, and when I was becoming a sensei, I told him exactly what I thought of him. A great guy I'm proud to have as my stepdad. As mentioned, my father moved away when I was young. He was always in the background and in my life, but I didn't get to see him very much. When I did, he often told, taught me things that I didn't particularly understand at the time. Surprisingly tender at times, he was always the sensei. You might say he was born to lead. He told me many times in many ways, you have to look out for number one. His exact words were, people do not do anything for anyone else. They do everything for themselves. I have seen many shocked looks when he had said that to others, and, admittingly, it took me many personal lessons to understand what he meant. At first blush, it sounds like he is saying people are all so self-absorbed that they don't care about helping others. That is a misunderstanding. That saying can mean many different things, whether you look at it as being selfish or see it as being your best self. I have been through the life ringer enough to squeeze out its meaning, and again, it was the dojo that revealed to me the truth of what he meant. That, however, took a very dark path of understanding. You could say, as a kid, I was attracted to trouble. I was drawn to people who have had tough lives. 
I was always interested in knowing about people in dark places, seeing what they have gone through, and then comparing them to myself, but not in a good way. It's fair to say that as a confused teenager, I would describe myself as a hoodlum. I was a pretty good kid, up until grade 8. Then, for some reason, I wanted to make everything harder. I decided I disliked school, started smoking, stealing alcohol from my parents' liquor cabinet, and ultimately having the police visit my home many times. I was a messed up nightmare of a child from the age of 12 to 17. The world was seemingly against me. I thought my family hated me and that they didn't care or wouldn't help. At the lowest point that I can recall in my life, my brother Lee asked me to help. Me? Help him? How in the world could I do that? You see, I was on probation for assault and robbery. I had been hanging out with the wrong crowd, and everything was pointing to a life of dead-end jobs, bad behavior, and perhaps even jail. Lee, for some strange reason, needed my help. He said he was in a jam at the karate school, and he needed a person he could trust and depend on. I said yes, but without thinking much about why. I figured I could go teach for a year, maybe two, make some money, and then figure out what I wanted to do with my life. The change truly happened for me when I walked into our old Douglas Street dojo to meet a former teacher of mine, Sensei Raj. Lee had set it up. I was going to assist Raj and, in turn, he would prepare me to teach full-time at the Cedar Hill Dojo. He welcomed me with open arms. We became friends instantly, and then training partners for life. Looking back, I see how Sensei's philosophy of everyone only works for themselves happens. Sensei Lee had a good teacher. He knew that if he had said, Kieran, you need the help and you need to clean up your act, that I would have most likely refused his offer to help. Instead, he knew the only way to help me was to help himself. I couldn't refuse him. He said the dojo needed me. Sensei Dad said, When you give someone a present, do a favor or a good deed, who are you really doing it for? Kieran, there aren't many saints like Mother Teresa in the world. Everyone only does things for themselves. Helping someone in need makes you feel needed. Let me ask you, how do you feel when you give someone a gift that you know they truly want? Is it more fun to be the giver or the receiver? When you give to others, you are giving to yourself first. The more you give, the more you get. In my mind, you do selfless acts for yourself. Your reward for helping others is how it makes you feel about yourself. You're putting yourself first by being able to give to another, right? That is the essence of the dojo. Interestingly, the word samurai, Japanese warrior, translates to English as to serve. To that end, the meaning of the sensei and the role of the dojo has become clear to me. Perhaps I have evolved and finally figured out that perplexing statement my father taught me. You must take care of yourself before you can take care of others. I know that is a common saying, but how many people have truly figured that out? I have yet to see this in myself, but I have seen it in my father. As a confused teenager, I thought that he was selfish. He had left me, and he left our family, but at the same time he cared for us through the dojo. I guess it's easy to see how that was confusing for a confused kid. In reality, he took care of himself to be a better person, he put himself in a position to ultimately help out his family and the others who would become part of it, and there are many. Through the dedication of my brother and the help of my friend Sensei Raj, I slowly changed into the person I was meant to be. My personality, my character, and my strength came from the same source that my entire family had used for decades, the dojo. The harder I worked, the more I put into it, the more I did for my life, the more I could give to my students and the people important to me. The more I gave, the more I received. That's when I became a real black belt. I found out what martial arts are and what this training means to me. This isn't my brother's version 
or even my father's, as everyone has different views. I own this one. My martial arts journey begins and ends with family. It took a while to figure out that my family has always been there, even when I thought they weren't. Lee being a brother and a father to me, my mother being the disciplinarian, Drew being my friend by encouraging me, and Brittany being a rock with no judgment. My stepdad showing me what hard work and perseverance means, and my mentoring father, ever the sensei, with his strange way of teaching about the meaning of being number one. Lastly, my brother from another mother, Sensei Raj, for showing me equality and how to trust true friendship. For me, it began with a comic book about a great man. Today, I am beginning to see that hero as seen through the eyes of my dojo students and me. I walk my talk with my martial arts, and I believe in family. The dojo is family, and yes, families struggle, but when they use this place to better themselves, they enhance the lives of everyone around them. A good dojo raises all involved, like a high tide raises all boats.